Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CRE PN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jade Aaron Grost. This is a podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today, my guest is Adam Gilbert. Adam is the president of The Firm Commercial, where he leads a team of agents specializing in commercial real estate sales, leasing, land acquisition development, government relations, and value add entitlement deals. And in just a minute, we're gonna speak with Adam about value add entitlement deals. But first, a quick reminder, if you like our show, CRE PN Radio, there are a couple things you can do to help. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We'd love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you wanna see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, you can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I wanna welcome my guest, Adam, welcome to CRE PN Radio. Thank you, I'm happy to be here and excited to have a chat today. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, that makes two of us, I guess now. The, um, uh, b before we get started here, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Yeah, definitely. So uh, most of the deals that I do are in Palm Springs, California area, a big hospitality uh, area, mostly known for hospitality, hotels and vacations. Um, so I was born and raised here and um, went to school, I actually became an attorney um, and uh, moved back to Palm Springs to practice law and found this little thing called uh, real estate and real estate investing, uh, which kept driving me away from the law office and uh, out onto the streets, looking at buildings and uh, doing deals. Uh, so about, I guess it's about six years ago now, I left practicing law full time. Uh, I started a real estate brokerage. I started a vacation rental management company doing Airbnbs, which I sold. And um, now I both run the brokerage, helping people find commercial deals and do a lot of investments myself. Awesome. Awesome. So you, you were on the, as far as the uh, attorney work, were you uh, doing courtroom stuff or corporate documents or what, what kind of? Yeah, I mostly, I mostly did civil litigation. So I would get the file and then go to the courtroom and, you know, do my argument or be negotiating on the phone. So uh, paperwork and stuff was never my forte, the getting down in the details and doing transactional stuff. I'm much more of a talker and, and get things done that way. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, the, uh, the attorney thing, it's kind of the, uh, you got to have them, but uh, it's always kind <laughs> of a, you know, how the sausage is made kind of thing. You know? I always say I'm a recovering attorney. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> so uh, real estate uh, sounds like you, you were doing uh, some investing in some Airbnb and you had the brokerage and, and uh, tell me a little bit about how you got started in real estate. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I, have, you know, ADHD to the nth degree uh, in terms of starting businesses and, and getting involved in different endeavors, um, which I think was why real estate investment is so great for me because I can do a few different projects at any given time and move on. Um, but I was practicing law. I sat down for my broker's license and I did a deal. It was like 2012. Uh, the market was, you know, just coming out of the, the pits of 2008. And um, my uncle wanted to, uh, he wanted to do a flip property. And so um, he's like, Hey, Adam, like, write it up. You know, you just got your broker's license. And so I did it. It took like 10 hours. We found the property. I wrote it up and I get this commission check. That's like 25% of my yearly pay as an attorney. And I'm just like, Whoa, there's like something to this, like, thing if I, I could figure it out. Um, and so that's kind of where the spark was born. And, um, you know, <laughs> I can't rely on, on my family to buy all the properties that, to keep a career going. So I had to, you know, hang a shingle, create a company. And, you know, I've been doing this now for about 10 years. Um, and so I've been able to kind of mark my way on, on the brokerage side. And then as I learned from other people, getting paid to do brokerage, what type of deals they were looking at and where they can make money. Um, I got a great education while getting paid and it, it gave me the opportunity to start doing deals myself. Awesome. And, and uh, so you started off though, kind of like in real estate doing the, the brokerage side of things. 
Yeah. And then started investing yourself or how did mm -hmm. you? Yeah. I mean, I started off, you know, at the beginning, you start off kind of where everyone does, you know, you'll take any, any, any client that will work with you. So I started off in single family residential, you know, kind of entry level homes, uh, condos, things like that. And then uh, quickly, you know, I was able to kind of move into larger scale luxury vacation homes, um, and then moved into commercial where there is just very few people, especially in my market, uh, you know, if there's 5,000, you know, residential realtors, there's like 20 commercial realtors who are, who are doing things. So I'm like, ah, okay. Like if I'm going to do something, I should go into that space. And, um, you know, just kind of really fell in love with the deal making aspect and kind of all of the, you know, seller carry and notes and, you know, all these different ways to really uh, make commercial deals work. Um, and then I really found value at entitlements, which I know we want to, we want to talk about. Um, and that's where I've really carved my niche as one of the very few people who are, you know, kind of doing these types of deals. Gotcha. So let's talk about uh, the, the value add entitlement deals. Um, can you give us some sort of a definition or give us an example of what uh, a uh, value add entitlement uh, is? Yeah. So, you know, entitlements can mean a number of things, but specifically it's getting approvals from a city or a county or some municipality um, to do some form of real estate deal or development. Um, and so that can be taking raw land and saying, hey, I want to build eight homes on it that can be doing, uh, to, uh, you know, buying a building and then changing the zoning um, to allow for a different use that increases the value of the building. Um, that can be, you know, one project I'm, I'm getting a drive through approved on a vacant piece of land that's already in a shopping center surrounded by other businesses. So, you know, if the land is worth, you know, we'll make it easy 500,000. And then I can get these plans approved through the city to do a drive through. Well, now I can maybe sell that piece of land for a million dollars, even though I've only invested some time at about $100,000 in architectural fees. So you really have the ca capacity, if you can figure it out, to do these 5x and 10x type deals uh, with minimal you know, capital. But it is a, a bit on the riskier side. Got it. So the, the raw land and its use, um, adding a drive-through uh, as a... As a um, an option. Um, do you find that most of the, the value add entitlement uh, work you do is with raw land or, or is it common to have an existing uh, built out structure and the, the use just be changed from, you know, A to B? Yeah, I would say when, when talking about entitlement, I think most people default to raw land and um, that's how most people think about it. Um, I've really Again, I'm now in the process of doing my third zone change. Um, and so that's kind of a little niche, even with the entitlements um, that I've kind of carved out to be able to try to achieve. Um, and, you know, every person, whatever town you're in, you've got that piece of land or that building. And you're just like, why hasn't anyone done anything with that? Or why, why is it sitting vacant? Right. And so for me, that sparks some creativity. It was like, okay, well, it probably doesn't work how it is. But if we can change the use and allow something else there, um, maybe there could be some value that's created. And so, um, you know, if you can buy it when it's not approved for that and then sell it when it is, um, there's the opportunity to create the, the value add of the entitlement, you know? Yeah, yeah. So if there is that property that you identify and, and it's just been sitting there and the question comes up, why has nobody done something with that property? Uh, is it you and your own creative mindset that kind of thinks of what the alternatives are, or do you um, go to the city and find out what, you know, what the limitations are and, and is it like based on what neighboring properties are zoned or their use or how do you, how do you approach, uh, I'm assuming you can't go to the middle of a suburban block and, and change it to a, you know, some sort of a, you know, a, a way outside of the, the zoning use, but more of like a, a corner lot or something's on like a busy street or something like that is more of a, a target for something like this. Definitely. And so the answer is all of the above. Um, it really, ha you have to one, know what the community needs. Um, two, you have to make sure that 
the use you're changing it to is not going to be a nuisance to the area. It should actually be an improvement. Um, you should be able to get your, you know, if you're trying to, to change, to do a zone change that people, I mean, people complain about all sorts of things, but is a negative impact on the community to, to make money, you're not going to be successful because they're going to go to their city council and they're going to go to all the levels and they're going to complain and your project's going to get, get shut down. Um, and then three, you know, yeah, you got to go to the city. You got to make sure it complies with different parts of the of the specific or general plan. Um, you have to make sure that there's no environmental impacts. I mean, I'm in California and it's, uh, you know, we have a very high barrier, uh, you know, in terms of making sure that we don't have um, environmental impacts. So uh, you gotta be very careful, but you really have to check all of those boxes um, and make sure that it's a project that, that fits the community in the area. So in each one of these scenarios where you, you know, you have a, a, a piece of property that's, um, zoned in a historical way that's kind of limited its use and nobody's using it or doesn't recognize the opportunities because they, it's not available right now. Um, is there like one, uh, you know, governing body that you have to approach or is it a series of bodies that you have to get the check off uh, approval and, and go through a sequence or is it every property is different? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so each city is going to have their own process. And you'd be surprised if you go to the planning desk of your city, they're going to be very knowledgeable about this process and, and what it takes in that very city. Typically, what you would do um, is, you know, there's applications to do different things, and you, you find out what you're going to need from your architect and engineer to do those. Um, but most cities have, you know, like an architectural review board, which is the first step. And then secondly, a planning commission, which is volunteer people who, you know, review planning projects. And then finally, for like a zone change, you're, you're going to have to go in front of your city council and mayor um, and, uh, and get those approvals. Now, sometimes like in my particular jurisdiction, um, we have tribal lands um, here, uh, Native American tribal lands. And so we actually have to get uh uh, our projects signed off and approved by the statewide tribal authority um, before we can do them. Um, and sometimes they'll, you know, ask for certain things. Um, I have one project right now that's very close to the airport. Um, and so I had to go through the airport land use commission. Um, so every project is different. Every city is unique. Um, but those are the typical steps that you'll have to go through for most entitlement deals. And sometimes, you know, Planning commission is the end all. You don't have to go to city council. Um, so it, it really just depends on the project in the municipality. Got it. Now, and in, in you mentioned, uh, you know, the public, um, you know, always has, uh, I guess, the uh, uh, opportunity to voice their opinion uh, for usage in that. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you find that if you uh, are working within the system and, and approach it kind of moving through the system into a, uh, and you're getting green lights from everybody that the public usually goes along, or do you find that that, is there, is there something you found that's like, uh, you know, good luck with that, the public, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, the, the public is always the public. So, I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, you could find the best projects in the world and you'll find people who will complain about it, um, you know, and that's across the board. Um, you know, what I try to do on, on all my projects, especially, you know, in Palm Springs, it's very um, community driven and we have a large neighborhood, active neighborhood organization groups. Um, and so I, before I did my project, my most recent project, I went to the neighborhood um, during their, their annual meeting and I said, hey, this is the project that I'm proposing. I want to get your guys' feedback. What are some issues that you're having? Are you having any negative impacts that I can address through my project? And they're like, yeah, actually, we have all these trucks coming from UPS that blow through our neighborhood early in the morning every day. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe I can propose some speed bumps or some speed humps or you know, something along those line, lines in my project that will alleviate that. And so, you know, as a, as a developer, you have the opportunity to solve problems. Um, you can create a lot of problems too. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have to be aware that, you know, you have an impact in the, in a community and you're coming into someone's existing home or business or, you know, commercial area and having an impact. So, you know, you can try to kind of sneak through and a lot of people do that. Um, but it really depends on the community, um, that, that you're in, and that's going to be in uh, the developer's discretion as to how they want to pursue it. 
Yeah. No, I, I had a little bit of experience with that and uh, you get a angry mob and it's uh, <laughs> tough to, uh, tough to appease them there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so you identify a property, you kind of, you get your uh, creative thinking hat on, you, you approach the different uh, bodies that uh, kind of regulate the, the decision-making, you get some direction. Um, what, what have you found kind of a time frame? I mean, this is, this is not like uh, you go down on a, you know, a Thursday and Monday, you've got a permit and you're ready to, to uh, ready, or you can sell the property kind of thing. What, is there any kind of a rule of thumb? Do you just kind of like in your head kind of assume that it's going to take X to amount of time to get something done? Definitely. And, you know, the old real estate adage, adage it always takes twice as long and costs cost twice as much, much as you originally expect. Um, it's kind of the, 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 the same for here. So, I mean, if you're not doing a zone change and you really just want to like get some, you know, you say, Hey, this is a great piece of residential land, residential real estate's going through the roof right now. Let's get some new homes approved. Um, and again, this is California. I've heard that there's other states that are way easier. Um, this, is, this is probably the hardest, uh, except for maybe like Hawaii, which I know has their own process. Um, it's usually about six to nine months if you're on top of it to get projects like that approved. If you're trying to do something a little extra, like a zone change, um, anticipate about 12 to 18 months. Um, but the way that I structure my deals to give me the most flexibility and hold my cash and not get too tied down to a deal is that I structure my purchase to have very long escrows to allow me to do these entitlements or do an option that gives you a long enough amount of time um, to be able to exercise that option once you get those um, entitlements approved. Got it. Now I was going to ask you about that as far as the, uh, the time uh, goes and how you structure the deal, because I'm assuming that when you identify a property and you need to gain control of it so that somebody else doesn't uh, figure it out or, you know, figure out that you're doing all this work and jump ahead of you and tie up the property. So step one would be gain control of the property. Is that, is that kind of the, Definitely. And making sure that you, um, you have uh, options to extend as much as you can, um, you know, because the last thing that you want to do is do all these entitlements to a project, your time runs out, and you can't sell it, or you can't do anything with it, and you can't close on it. And now all these entitlements go to the property holder and the, 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 the owner, right? Um, so timing is always, uh, you know, people talk about location, 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 my business is timing, 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 and making sure you have enough time. Um, and one of my first deal, we actually had, I'd say the fair market value was probably around 3 million, but we sold it at 2.6 because we needed to close it within 30 days. Um, and so um, that was a timing issue because we didn't want to do all of this work, spend all this money and get no return. Um, so flexibility is key. Got it. And is that pretty common with land deals as far as just kind of the understanding of the, the way the deal works is that you've got somebody and the seller, I'm assuming there's some sort of compensation, the money that goes hard or whatever, as yep. far as uh, when you write up a deal that there's a, a fee that you're putting down and then the option fees and do, do those options then uh, apply to the purchase if you execute or are they can you speak One, a little bit then? Yeah, 100%. So typically I'll have a 60 to 90 day initial due diligence period, uh, at which point, depending on the size of the deal, you know, 20 or $30,000 will go hard. Um, from there, I'll have maybe another six months after that um, to kind of do some more due diligence, at which point I would have to put in another 20 or 30,000 to get another three months. So that there gets you your year, essentially. Um, and, but the, all of those become non-refundable but applicable to the purchase price. Um, so that if you do close that, you know, the, the, those count towards it. Um, but, you know, most of the time uh, with land, it's just sitting there anyway. So the owner has really not many expenses. Um, and if you give them their price, they're willing to give you terms. If you're, you know, if you're trying to come in and, and lowball them, they're going to want you to close really quick. Um, same thing with the building. You know, when I did the zone change on, on that that building that I was referring to the 15,000 square foot warehouse, he had it on the market. Um, it was overpriced. Um, and so it wasn't doing anything, but I gave him his price, 
but I got my terms and I got my time to be able to do it so that I was able to create that additional value. No, I, this whole uh, kind of uh, entitlement deal thing it just makes me think about how many times and I've seen something, you know, and, and thought, God, that like you see a, a property, there's a structure and there's a big lot that's vacant. You know, I'm thinking like, God, if you could cut that off and sell that and do this and do that. And, and uh, I'm assuming there's some entitlements most of the time that haven't been figured out. That's why there's no movement or there's, I don't know, maybe there's just not enough demand or whatever, but um, it seems to me like it's a lot of fun, but also probably kind of test your patience just on the, on the time it takes to uh, make a deal as opposed to uh, like your first deal with uh, 10 hours of work and a, and a big paycheck <laughs> kind of thing. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's um, it, I describe it as hurry up and slow down, right? So you'll have like something and, you know, you'll have this hearing coming up and you're working 10 to 20 hours, you know, on that week on getting everything ready. And then you don't do anything for three months right? As it's like going through the process. And so it, it's a lot like that. And these deals allow me to do them on the side um, of my, you know, regular business, which is the, the brokerage um, that pays the bills and, and keeps it going and funds essentially some of these investment deals. Um, and so, but yeah, exactly to your point, you know, um, people, there's always things that can be done, but people either don't have the imagination, the time, the money or the patience to do it. Um, so if you see that raw piece of land with a defunct building on it, but you're like, man, I could put a drive through on that corner and then build a strip center around it. Um, you don't have to actually build it. If you just get it approved, you know, uh, and you get that like drive through pad approved, you sell that to a developer who does Carl's Jr's or Wiener Schnitzels or Starbucks or whatever it is. And if you think about it and, you know, it's like, okay, well, I paid a million for this land. Well, now I just sold that pad to Starbucks for a million dollars. And so everything else that I'm going to do on it is now gravy. And so that's how I think about it. And not every deal works that way, um, but you can really create a lot of value if you can think outside the box and then do the work that, you know, the guy who's developing Starbucks, he doesn't want to learn every city council um, and what they want and go through all the meetings. He wants to develop Starbucks. So if you could become an expert in your jurisdiction of what you're doing, um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for you to create those relationships over time. No, that's, that's a good, good insight there. Do you, with that knowledge at local knowledge, um, does it help you then kind of look out in the, in the community to see where like a path of progress is or identify, um, you know, if there's a, they're wanting a new expressway or they're wanting to create a certain zone or whatever. Does that give you kind of insight as to, you know, if you hunt out in that area, you find something and huh, this could, this could work or, or is it more in your real estate uh, business that you're, you're familiar with the area. And then as you hear these ideas from the, uh, um, I guess the, I don't know, it was the planning commission or whatever that, mm -hmm. that they, they want to change some zoning and stuff that, yeah, or I guess I, I don't know if it makes sense, but is there is there one that leads the other, or like is it the the i the the planning commission that leads, or is it just your basic knowledge of the real estate that leads, or is it kind of a combination of the both? You know, it really is a combination of the of the both. You know, you have to think long term about things and not where things are today, but where will they be three to five years from now? And so, if you find out that you know we're we're having an arena built. Um, in our in our jurisdiction for a minor league ice hockey team, right? So, okay, well, they're building an arena. Well, now that's underserved for fast food in that area, right? And so when, if you pay attention to things that are coming in, you know, once they build the arena, it's too late, you know? Um, but if you can keep your eye to the local newspaper, you'd be amazed how many people don't follow the local city council meetings. Um, you know, I'm not saying that you have to, um, you know, sit there and watch them because they're, exceedingly long and, you know, boring, uh, unless you, your particular project is on there. Um, but getting a quick update about what the decisions are, or even just looking at the agenda. Oh, wow. Like, you know, this developer is trying to get a Chick-fil-A approved there. Like, okay, then I'm going to take a look what's going on around there. Are there any lots that I can identify that, you know, I can now try to tie up and, you know, so doing a lot of that work and just thinking ahead um, and being proactive instead of reactionary, um, is going to lead to, you know, in my experience, a lot of success. No, I love it. The, uh, just kind of really thinking outside of the box. And, and I think also, 
uh, there's got to be a discipline of time and just kind of, I don't think that most people have that sense of time, um, you know, or, or the willingness to wait uh, for something like that for the payoff. It seems more like, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're talking, you know, flipping, they're looking for a payout, you know, right away, or even just as a real estate broker, a list, sell, you know, get paid kind of thing. Um, but more of kind of that, that long-term, uh, in, in, you know, what we've talked about so far is you're not even doing the work. You're just getting it all, you know, green lighted so that the work can be done and making the sale. And then there's the whole nother level of, of getting the permits and doing the work and all that. So, I mean, you know, if you had an idea for a, uh, or, you know, you tie up a property, you go through your year long process to get it to the point where it can be approved, then whoever buys that property has another permitting process. So you could be in a construction process. So you, you could be literally two to three years from your idea to the actual, the, the product that's, um, you know, the, the, the public's able to see and use and, and go visit. Is that pretty typical? Very, very easily. Um, and that's why if you can do that first step of getting that pad approved, um, it makes the, you know, the tension for the, whoever wants to develop that pad in the future um, so much easier. So it's not a three-year process for them. It's now a one-year process. Like, ah, the pad is approved. We've got it. Now I just need to build my, you know, Etch-a-Sketch model of it looks the same and I pop it here in, in each different place. Um, and you can even get to the point, you know, uh, I can't even screw in a light bulb, but you could be the, you could develop it yourself, um, you know, be a contractor or team up with a contractor and, and build it out and lease it out um there's lots of developers who go the full monty um but i really try to specialize on the uh on, on the first part of the equation that's that's what i like to do yeah now, it's interesting as you mentioned that being the first uh part or being you know near the first part kind of thing is really where the opportunity lies i know uh years ago in college i remember i was uh working for a landscaping crew and we were out in these new developments and i remember that at every uh, exit ramp uh, off the freeway, the first thing that would go in was like a quick trip or some sort of a you know convenience store with gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was the landmark that said there was you know progress was coming kind mm -hmm. of thing. And um, you know I guess if you would have you know bought on the other side of the street or you know put another gas station in or I guess as as um, you know it fills in there, but just kind of what what are those cues I guess for you know, progress and, and how to recognize them would be, um, uh, you know, something to, to learn and, and to recognize and, and uh, find. So that's awesome. Definitely. And, e and each city and each jurisdiction is going to have their own cues. Um, you know, I know as soon as a Chick-fil-A comes into a certain place, you know, like everything blows up around it or in and out is what we have. It's like you get an in and out, like, boom, your property values all around it go, go up because the nose is going to drive the traffic. Um, so if you follow and say, Hey, look, you know, they're proposing this or this is coming. Um, you know, you can, you can predict the future. Yeah. Well, it, it is, uh, you know, it's a different lens to look through. I think that, uh, you know, most people are, uh, you know, when I, I think of investing in, in more of a, a ready uh, built uh, property, not something that's uh, ground up or construction or something like that. It's more of kind of a, the, the surrounding area, kind of the demographics, the ability for people to pay, um, you know, what, what's there that's going to attract somebody to the property uh, and make it, make it valuable. And then if you have uh, the opportunity to increase rents or, uh, I mean, typically when I think of, or when I talk with people about value add, it's more about how can you reposition the property from a physical standpoint or even an operational management standpoint. Um, you know, if the seller is kind of tired and, and hasn't really been keeping up with, um, you know, the market or if the, the property's tired and it needs a refresh, um, those are typically the things that I think I hear uh, from people that are doing, quote, value add, um, you know, investment strategies. But what I love about yours is it's, it's, it's basically, it's just how, you know, how far can you think outside of the box? Now, it does sound like there's a fair amount of capital you have to have uh, available to, you know, tie up the property, uh, and then ex exercise a number of extensions if needed in order to get it. And like, I'm assuming, uh, you know, either know somebody like you or be willing to walk through all the steps to get it 
to the finish line so that you then can, um, you know, have that potential sale or, and I'm assuming in that there's also the need to have some sort of conversation with potential uh, investors, buyers, developers that would want to develop a property like that. Um, so it sounds like it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of hats you're wearing there and, and, uh, but it's kind of cool. I like the, uh, the kind of the way you're, you're, um, you know, what you, what you go through to get the, uh, the property to that next stage. Definitely. And I, and I know you always uh, discuss uh, the factor of risk, uh, you know, on your show and, and in any given deal. And just to point out, like, this is an ancillary part of my business um, because the amount of capital that you have to put in, as you mentioned, with the non-refundable deposits, with the architect, with the engineers, with the city fees, um, if you are unsuccessful in getting your entitlement or your zone change, that all goes away and you have no tangible asset left because all you had was a, an escrow or an option. Um, and so this type of work is on the riskier side. Right, right. So let me ask you, uh, the, uh, the question that I do ask people is what is the biggest risk? Is that what you, what you, uh, you, you would, you know, your, your, your biggest risk would be just that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is probably on the riskier side of the type of investment deals that I do. So, I mean, I, I have a shopping center that I'm doing a value add facade enhancement on, um, you know, that's a tangible asset. These entitlement deals, I would say they're on the risk. They're, they are probably the biggest risk in terms of deals that I do, because again, if I'm unsuccessful in getting the entitlements, um, I've now just pissed away all my money um, for something that I was able to create no value on. Um, but, the, if I am successful, then the returns are high enough, you know, 5x, 10x to justify that risk. Um, and, you know, what I equated to is of, you know, playing poker. Um, you know, I'd try to do as much due diligence as I can. And uh, if I'm holding two kings, if I'm holding a great hand, I can still lose, you know, uh, but I'm taking a calculated risk and knowing that I'm willing to make a bet because I've, I, I think that this is where this particular property and this project needs to go. No, that's cool. That's cool. I like that. Um, and in your line of work, I mean, you mentioned like there's 5,000 residential uh, real estate agents in the area and then like 20, um, you know, commercial uh, or some sort of ratio like that. Yeah. Um, do you find that uh, there's even fewer that work in the entitlement uh place? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming not all of those commercial brokers work in the entitlement uh, area. Yeah, very few. I'm always surprised how few commercial brokers actually even own commercial real estate. I'm like, come on, man, like, this is your business. Like you should be you should be picking up all the best deals, right? Um, but yeah, there are, I would say even fewer, um, you know, there are like consulting companies that do this, you know, large, usually for larger developers or big corporations. And, you know, they've got engineers, architects on staff. They're typically very expensive um, to be able to, and that's why projects cost so much. But if you're building like a Walmart, like that ain't me, you know, like hire a big company with like all of the staff and the relationships to do that. Um, what I do is again, I, I say, I'm not looking for home runs. I'm looking for singles and doubles. I'm looking for small projects that are probably too small for the big guys, um, but fit right into my little niche of where, I mean, if I can create $500,000 or, you know, to a million dollars on a project and value, and that's usually where I'm going for, um, if I can do a couple of those every year, I'm set, you know, that, that's, 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 that's great. Uh, if I do one of those in a year, you know, you're having a great year, but that's kind of the, the, the small niche area that I look into. And there are opportunities there because they're too small for the big guys. And most people don't have the knowledge to be able to take it to the next level and do what I do. Awesome. Well, Adam, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? I'm on all the social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I'm either at Adam Gilbert 13 or Adam Gilbert ESQ as an Esquire. Um, and feel free to follow me, chat with me, go to my website, Adam Gilbert Esquire, uh, ESQ.com or the firm commercial.com. Got it. Adam, I can't say thanks enough for uh, taking the time to talk today. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, learned a lot and uh, hope we can do it again soon. Awesome. I'd be happy to be back anytime. All right. 
For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.